Good morning. I don't know whether to take it that Wayne thinks you should go to lunch after his talk or he recognizes that my brain is going blah after listening to his talk. No, I'm going to keep it. No problem. So uh, we're going to talk about oxygen therapy and airway clearance. I bring a little bit of a unique perspective to this because I am boarded and practice both pulmonary and critical care. In fact, the majority of my time is spent in the ICU when I'm not handling the home vent patients. So I bring you a little bit of a difference here. If you can't hear me, let me know. The last three years I have followed Wayne, and I think they do that because they think I can get up here and get you re uh, energize from your brain spinning like mine. I've heard that talk from Wayne now four years, four times, and it still makes my brain spin. I have no financial relationships to disclose, but I'm happy to entertain any ideas. And our learning objectives are uh, pretty clear, looking at why we have hypoxemia, looking at when we use oxygen, looking at particle delivery in various aerosols, and looking at airway clearance. And ultimately, we would like you to give better care and manage to pass the boards. Um, believe me, having done both the pulmonary and the critical care boards now many times, because I too am a senior citizen, the pulmonary boards are difficult. They're harder than the critical care, but I have total faith that you can do this. It's just knowing your physiology and knowing what makes sense. So let's start with hypoxia. What makes somebody become hypoxic? Well, the first thing is hypoventilation. You have decreased respiratory drive. This is like a congenital central hypoventilation or Undine's curse. You have chest wall injury or damage, or you have respiratory muscle weaknesses, which is what we see in our patients with muscular dystrophy. If you use the alveolar gas equation, which is one of the equations that you need to know for the boards. I will give you a few board taking hints while I'm here because I teach a board review course for our critical care fellows where there are even more formulas. And I learned this from one of my colleagues. It's a great attempt. When you go and sit down, you're already nervous. Oh, sit down and in the corner of your paper, you can write out all those seven or eight equations that you had to memorize so that when you get to the question on the alveolar air equation or on the time constants, you've got it there. You don't have to think about it. It's there. And you can write it on the paper even before the timer goes off because you're sitting there. You also have diffusion, lobectomy, emphysema, pulmonary edema, interstitial fibrosis, and that's where you have decreased surface area of the lungs or a thickened basement membrane. So if you have bad enough asthma with a really thickened basement membrane, you have somewhat of a diffusion defect, even though most of the hypoxia seen in asthmatics is from ventilation perfusion mismatch. And remember, you can measure diffusion with the DLCO. The other big piece of hypoxia that I, we get a lot of questions on, in fact, I was found it interesting on the pretest. The question about shunt was not my question. It was somebody else's who's here. Is that if you have an AV malformation, if you have congenital heart disease with right to left shunt, or if you have pulmonary hypertension, you can measure this with the flow study, or you can measure it actually just with, you put the patient on room air, get a blood gas, you put them on 100% oxygen, get a blood gas, and the PO2s are essentially no different. The most common cause of hypoxia in the patients that we all see is ventilation perfusion mismatch, pneumonia, atelectasis, and if you have a low venous oxygen content, your body will take more oxygen from the blood than usual. So if you're anemic, if you have fever or low cardiac output, you still get ventilation perfusion mismatch. Now, when you look at how oxygen gets through the blood, oxygen content and oxygen capacity are two different concepts. Try very hard not to confuse them. Oxygen content is the total amount of blood carried by the oxygen. Oxygen capacity is the maximum amount of oxygen that can be combined with your hemoglobin. 
And then oxygen saturation is the number or percentage of binding sites that the hemoglobin has attached to. So therefore, we know one gram of hemoglobin can combine with 1.34 mils of oxygen. Therefore, the oxygen capacity for a child with a hemoglobin of 14 is about 19. This is why the correct answer to any time they give you a list of things you can do to improve oxygenation, if the hemoglobin is not normal, transfusion is always the right answer. Remember that PO2, when you look at the gas equation, contributes 0.003. It is the percent saturated that is the major part of the oxygen capacity and oxygen content. So you have to have adequate hemoglobin which is very, very important, clinically particularly. So I tried to put on my questions the kinds of things that are harder for us to remember. So what is the principle behind pulse oximetry? You can go back to Dear Dr. West, and I agree his lectures on YouTube are quite fun from the British accent. So you can go ahead and put your answers in. All right, so the vast majority of you got it that it's Beer-Lambert law. We're gonna talk about Bernoulli's law a little bit later, and Henry's law has to do with gas exchange. So let's look at what happens with pulse oximetry. Pulse oximetry, and a few of us in this room, I'm gonna to get to pick on Wayne since uh, he was uh, trying to send you to lunch instead of staying for my talk. A, a few of us, I could, I could use lunch first too. A few of us in this room practiced medicine before pulse oximetry came into bearing. And when we would go around on rounds at night and do arterial blood gases on all the kids on oxygen to see if they could be weaned. Now the minute you wipe the alcohol across their radial artery, they screamed and their PO2 dropped significantly. So pulse oximetry to me was one of the great advances in medicine in my career. So what happens with pulse oximetry is you get pulsatile absorption is detected by the sensor as arterial flow. Remember, oxyhemoglobin and reduced hemoglobin have different absorption spectra. Therefore, using the Beer-Lambert law, the concentration of any solute in solution can be measured by its absorption of light. So remember, that's a very straightforward, simple Dr. West physiology. I just got the uh, 2015 updated version. It's still pretty much the same, new questions though. So why is pulse oximetry not always a good thing? So in the intensive care unit particularly, you can be fooled with this. The first one is an abnormal hemoglobin, meth hemoglobin, carboxy hemoglobin, fetal hemoglobin, sickle cell disease to a lesser degree, will interfere with the absorption. It shifts your oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve to the left, and your saturation will read actually higher than it truly is if you measure a saturation in a blood gas lab. And remember, most of the blood gases you get by point of care are calculated from the PO2, they're not measured. So where does this come into play? Well, let's take carboxyhemoglobin. I received a patient in the intensive care unit who had been in a house fire, bad smoke inhalation, intubated in the field by the paramedics, her saturation's 100%, but her perfusion is horrible, she looks horrible, she looks blue, but she's covered with black soot. Well, the paramedics had intubated her esophagus, but because her saturation was reading 100, they assumed that she was intubated. And you know, in children, you can hear, small children, you can hear breath sounds from the top of the chest to the big toe, so you don't always recognize the tube is out. Meth hemoglobin is another way that this can present. We had a baby come in who was getting her formula diluted with well water, had iron intoxication, developed meth hemoglobinemia, and her saturations were much higher than 
her actual oxygenation was. Low perfusion states, the one place where we could use it the most, if you're cold and clamped down, your oxygen saturation doesn't pick up very well. If you have too much ambient light, and this is a problem in the operating room sometimes, it can be a problem in the intensive care unit, if you have dark nail polish or artificial nails, that's why they make you take your nail polish off if you're going for a procedure. And uh, part of my pre-op instructions, I'm getting my other knee replaced in three weeks. Part of my pre-op instructions are to take off all your nail polish. And that's appropriate, otherwise your oximetry may not pick up any kind of dye that the patient has had or motion artifact. And we know all about that with the babies because they're always shaking their foot and we put socks on them to keep the light out, socks on them to try to keep the catheter from moving. So that all of those things can be an issue for pulse oximetry. This is a very famous frequent board question because it is practical and has science with it and there is no debate about the right answer. Now, transcutaneous oxygen monitoring is pretty much gone the way of the world, but it's still under the content specifications, so I put it up here for you. Oxygen saturation, far better than transcutaneous, obviously. Uh, in this, you have to have adequate gas exchange and tissue perfusion, and the biggest reason that it really isn't used very often in pediatrics anymore is that you had to warm the skin up pretty warm to facilitate hyperperfusion and get your PO2 off of it. The problem with that is that the babies got burned and they look like they had polka dots of red burn from the transcutaneous monitor. It, as compared to pulse oximetry, actually measures the pulse partial pressure of oxygen. And it is, again, limited use because of burns. It doesn't work very well in people that have excess tissue in older patients because their skin is thicker and you had to calibrate it all the time. So it is still under content specs, but the main thing you want to remember is it measures PO2 and not saturation. Now mixed venous saturation content, SVO2, is very, very come to the forefront in the treatment of shock, and this is why they want you to know this. So oxygen content of the pulmonary arterial circulation, therefore this is where you mix your systemic and your heart venous blood in the pulmonary trunk. It tells you your relationship between how much oxygen is delivered and how much is demanded. It's a surrogate marker for cardiac index, ideally measured in the pulmonary artery, but generally measured in the superior vena cava in the jugular vein and has taken ICU line placement now to be much more internal jugular so that you can measure mixed venous saturation. You can measure it in the central venous circulation such as in ephemeral vein, but it is not very accurate. The goal is 65 to 75, and all of the surviving sepsis campaigns use goal-measured outcomes looking at keeping your mixed venous sat in the 70s. And so it can be very helpful, but it is used more for shock than anything else. You, again, need to know what it's measuring and what a normal number is. Now, some of these questions are, or content specs are kind of, yeah, right, and we all know this. When do you give oxygen? You give oxygen for asthma, BPD, bronchiolitis, pneumonia. You give oxygen in cyanotic heart disease if you have pulmonary hypertension. Remember, if you have cyanotic heart disease and you do not have pulmonary hypertension, giving oxygen can actually cause the child to go into pulmonary edema and that there's a reason that you want their saturations limited. The worst thing you can do to a stage one Norwood is to get their PO2 too high. And so you have to be careful with that. We also use it with interstitial lung disease. We use it with COPD, which is the adult version of BPD, but different mechanisms. But they are fairly similar in how we care for them. And then in obstructive sleep apnea, but remember in obstructive sleep apnea, if you get your PO2 or your saturation too high, you can trigger hypoventilation. These are the various oxygen delivery systems. Every hospital has various ways that they utilize this. The NICU still does use some oxygen hoods. There are very few other places that will use oxygen hoods because it's hard for any child who has 
any degree of consciousness to put their head in a hood, although I just read an interesting article about a new uh, helmet kind of ventilation in adults where they put something that looks like a space helmet over your head and uh, provide oxygen and pressure that way. It's meant to, to replace like BiPAP, CPAP. It'll be interesting if it comes into fruition. Using an oxygen tent, we used to use this in croup all the time. You can imagine when you lifted up the corner of the tent to evaluate the patient where the oxygen went. So it doesn't give you very much. Nasal cannula, you know, you can give a lot of oxygen. And although the correct answer is it gives up to 50%, don't forget that in that teeny tiny preemie, that is on a quarter of a liter breathing 80 times a minute, your actual FiO2 may be much higher of what's delivered to the baby. A non-rebreather mask, if you have it tight to the face, you can get close to 100%. And it is really the only way to get close to 100% without intubating a patient. And then a Venturi mask, which we're going to talk a little bit about here shortly, which is where you di dial the valve can give you around 24 to 40%. This is most commonly used now in the hospital and also used for trach patients where we will put a venturi or valve in line with their trach collar so that you are actually going to have to tell them what percentage of oxygen you want in your venturi mask. So what a venturi mask does is it entrains air at a constant level so that you get a pre set oxygen flow rate. Now having said that, we take care of kids, right? How many of you have kids on oxygen trach collars that the trach is sitting here and the trach collar is over here, right? Usually that means you can wean the oxygen. And that's even true in a hospital where you put a mask on a child, nine times out of 10 it comes back off, right? None of us really want to leave those things on. But it's a whole high flow device where the inspired amount of oxygen depends on how much oxygen is entrained in the room air if the patient's inspiratory flow rate does not exceed the total flow. So they don't work well. You'll never hear the NICU using a Venturi mask, right? because those babies have very high flow states, high respiratory rates, and they don't work very well. A venturi is something that is narrow in the middle, then at the ends, it's something we also use in carburetors, if that helps you think about how it brings your oxygen and gives it a constant flow. So some of the challenges that we have in giving oxygen to our patients, one, it's influenced by various patient traits, such as the size, the tidal volume of the patient's breathing, respiratory rate and depth, and by the delivery device itself, and by how much room air is entrained. Humidification is essential, essential, but can cause temperature variation in small infants, and if you get the humidifier fischer pikel turned up enough, you can actually induce a low-grade fever in a child, and it's very confusing when that happens. Tape and adhesive break down the skin, cause skin irritation, very similar to what a BiPAP mask can do, and can be a real wound issue for hospitals who are being penalized for things that are considered pressure sores. They can take it out. They can get entangled in the long cord. So you send a child home who is on Four, lead, four feet of cord, 20 feet of cord, however you choose to do it. Think of how much damage an infant can do with four feet of oxygen tubing. Now, the other piece that's very important here is that your patient's gonna come and ask you, can I put an extender on my tube so Johnny can move further in the house? Yes, you can. It is absolutely true that the gas flow at the end of the tube attached to an oxygen source is independent of the length of the tube. So you will get the amount of oxygen. Where you get into trouble is the flow. So if you're on a flow-triggered device, if you're on 25 feet of tubing, you're not necessarily going to be able to trigger that unless you turn the flow up. So particularly if you're using a concentrator and you use extra oxygen, my brother has end-stage COPD, has a concentrator, likes to get in the pool at our house, he has 50 feet of cord. If he gets in the pool where he's really far away from the concentrator, we have to turn the flow up on the concentrator or he feels short of breath. So those are things you have to think about if you're going to use long tubing. 
What kind of oxygen delivery systems do we have? We have liquid, which is very important for a backup. You have a reserve and a reservoir, and you do not need electricity for it. These are the classic green cylinders that we use in the hospital, and your patients use liquid oxygen. The challenge with liquid oxygen is it has to be refilled fairly frequently, and it is very expensive. You can use compressed gas. That's the big cylinder. It's called an H cylinder. Um, they are a huge, huge fire source. So one of my patients home on a ventilator had her H cylinder out on the porch. The parents went out to smoke. I know that doesn't happen in any of the other states in the country, but in Indiana, they went out to smoke and they blew up the house. So you have to be careful with that. And then the concentrator is truly the most economical. Uh, CMMS, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Reimbursement have cut oxygen reimbursement tremendously. You will be getting more and more problems with putting patients on oxygen because the home care companies really don't want to deliver it. Um, it takes oxygen from ambient air, but it requires electricity. Remember, for small infants, a concentrator requires you to initiate the flow, and they may not have enough flow to use a concentrator. Some of the original concentrators um, had problems with this with small infants. We used to send babies with BPD home on concentrators, and we had several deaths, and that was the end of that. But the adult concentrators that are out now work very well for any child who is big enough to generate the flow and are much less expensive. Now let's talk a little bit about humidification. We are in Arizona where humidity is quite uh, fun. Um, so relative humidity is the percent of the maximum amount of moisture that's possible in a given volume of air for a specific temperature. Absolute humidity is what you have now, what the concentration of the water vapor is in the air right now. So when you look at the average person, in the nose, your temperature is about 22 degrees centigrade. The relative humidity is about 50%, and the absolute humidity is about 10 milligrams per liter, not in Arizona. In your posterior pharynx, it goes up to about 95%, and by the time you get in the trachea, which is closer to room to body temperature, then your relative humidity should be 100%. And this tells us why we need a humidification source for small children on oxygen. What happens if you have dry air? You destroy your cilia, which we all know are very important for host defense mechanism for moving pollens and things through the tracheobronchial tree. It will damage the basement membrane of your cells. It can desquamate airway cells. It can cause irritation of your mucosa, particularly in the nose. It can cause bronchoconstriction. It's one of the reasons we do cold air challenge for some bronchial provocation tests. And can make your sputum be retained, thick, and nasty, and can cause atelectasis. However, if you're too humidified, then you can get too much moisture in the air, too much heat in the air, and you can get mucociliary changes with that too. So you really need things to be close to the normal amount of humidification that a patient would receive breathing room air in a normal climate. So you can use cold air humidifications, gas goes over the surface of the water, at room temperature. This is the bubbler that you use on your wards where it comes off the wall. You add in a little tank of water, a little uh, plastic container of water. You can only use it in somebody who's breathing spontaneously because you have to make the bubbles and in patients who are not intubated and in patients who do not have a trach tube. There are some recent studies that were published saying that maybe not all oxygen needs to be humidified, but for the purpose of the boards, that has not caught up yet and it is not dogma yet. Heated humidification, you have to have a heating source. So therefore, that requires electricity. Temperature is set between 30 and 37. You have risk of airway burns and risk of getting a water bolus into the airway. So that if you have somebody on CPAP or BiPAP and they have a heated humidification circuit, 
Uh, those patients can come in with irritation or burn across the chest where the tubing lies, so you have to make sure it's not set too high. You can get rain out in the tubing, and then you will not get the pressure through the tubing as well as you want. And in the trait kids, if your parent at home or the respiratory therapist or nurse in the hospital takes their tubing, runs it up over the crib size, and they disconnect it goes into the child. And that's why that the humidification piece always needs to be lower than the child or you will give them a water bolus. And it can cause a lot of trouble. Now you can also use a heat and moisture exchanger. These are the little white filters that go over the end of a trach. You can use them in line with the ventilator circuit. And what they do is they contribute to dead space which means you may need a little more tidal volume to overcome that or pressure, depending on your, whether you're pressure or volume ventilating. They also can become totally occluded with secretions. And the most worrisome thing for me, of course, is that the toddlers take them off and throw them at you, right? Because they don't really want them on there anyhow. So, um, and so you get something flying through the air full of uh, secretions. I think in pulmonology world, I can use the word snot. I use the word snot teaching at a primary care course and was reprimanded for it in the comments that that was a nasty word. But we're all used to mucus. So I think we see lots of snot. It's a true story, I wouldn't lie. In Hawaii, of all places, how can you be that unhappy in Hawaii to think snot is a bad word? <laughs> So the clinical sequence of symptoms of oxygen toxicity, this is really, really important. And I think one of the things we have learned over my career in medicine is that we used to, if you were, came out of the parent in the delivery room and you looked a little blue, you went right on 100%, no questions, no nothing. And now we have found that there is a lot of problems with hyperoxia and as you well know, our colleagues in the ICU on the pulmonary wards, they like those SATs to be 100 because the patient's gonna behave. But we now know really leaving SATs that high are not good for patients, and this is the reason. So if you leave somebody on 100% oxygen, in the first 12 to 24 hours, you get altered tracheal clearance of secretions, you'll start coughing, being short of breath, and have chest pain. By 36 hours, your gas exchange deteriorates, you have an increased AA difference and decreased lung compliance. By the time we get up to 50 to 60 hours, we cause increased epithelial permeability, inactivate surfactant, you get non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and then you get ARDS. And this is in a healthy person, in this study, animals. And then pulmonary oxygen toxicity relates both to how long and how much. And my favorite study for this, which is a very old study, it took rats, put them in various levels of oxygen. Because, you know, we talk a lot in the ICU about 60% being that magic cutoff. It's really not. In these rats, if they were in 40%, more died than if they were in 30%. If they were in 30%, more died than if they were in 25%. If they were in room air, more died than if they were in 18% oxygen. So clearly, oxygen can cause toxicity at any amount, and we have to consider that when we have a patient on oxygen who may or may not need it. That has been one of the beauties of pulse oximetry, is that we're seeing oxygen nation through various states. The blood gases that we used to go through the pulmonary ward and do on evening rounds was a one moment in time. We didn't see them asleep, we didn't see them eating, so pulse oximetry has really revolutionized our ability to monitor oxygenation and decrease exposure by keeping our SATs lower. And so now the goal is really keeping them 88 to 92 versus keeping them 100, which is a big change in clinical practice. Oxygen and atelectasis, you all know this, this is classic pulmonology, that if you breathe 100% oxygen, you wash out the nitric oxide in the lung and you decrease your vital capacity significantly. So what happens is that you get what's called absorption atelectasis. You again wash out nitrogen, get poorly ventilated units, become non-ventilated units. And this relates to the sum of the pressures in the alveoli being greater than the sum in the blood leading to rapid collapse in the alveoli 
villi. So again, 100% oxygen is not our friend and should really be used minimally only for resuscitation of a non-cardiac child and then should be turned down immediately. Now this is pretty a uh, yeah duh statement. Every set of people that do guidelines have guidelines, asthma, bronchiolitis, pneumonia. But notice again that in general, most of these ASATs are 88 to 92. The exception is the neonatal chronic lung disease where they are still fighting over what is the right amount of oxygen to give a preemie. They still don't know this is the most recent guidelines. Um, it's very interesting, remember that P small a O2 is related to ROP and P large a or alveolar O2 is related to lung oxygen toxicity. But I can tell you that in this situation, less is better and that there is nothing wrong with saturations of 88 to 92, period. And so we all need to be on the same uh, experience with that. Hyperbaric oxygen, which is used very limited today, um, is inhalation of 100% oxygen at pressures greater than atmospheric. So remember Boyle's Law, Wayne just went over this with you, pressure, product of pressure volume is a constant. Henry's Law, the amount of gas dissolved in the liquid is proportional to the pressure applied to it. Therefore, during hyperbaric, your body behaves like a liquid and dissolves considerable amount of oxygen. What kind of diseases and how could this help us and how can it hurt us? One, it improves oxygen content and delivery. It can cause vasoconstriction with decreased edema. Enhances host defense mechanisms, kills anaerobes. Gives you bubble reduction in uh, arterial gas embolism and decompression sickness, and it will cause neovascularization and collagen formation post-radiation ischemic issues. When do we use it? Air gas embolism, decompression sickness, carbon monoxide poisoning, if you can get them to a center very quickly, because if you give 100% oxygen in the burn unit for an hour or two, they're out of dangerous levels. If you can't get them moved, very quickly, it is not really in your interest. Gas gangrene, and this is quite interesting for patients who have very bad wounds, ischemic grafts and flaps, they can actually provide hyperbaric oxygen and get some reasonable healing. Use has to be balanced by the risk. Um, remember, the onset of oxygen toxicity is gonna to be higher because it's proportioned to alveolar toxicity, so it's much quicker with hyperbaric oxygen. And then there's a caregiving risk. Any of you ever seen a hyperoxygen thamer chamber? It's kind of like a casket if you have a uniplex, right? You put a patient in there and you can't touch them. There's a dualplex chamber, multiplex, where you can put your caregiver in there, but do I really want my intubated patient in a hyperbaric chamber where I can't get to them if they get into trouble? It's a uh, it's a great physiologic exercise, but not very practical for most things. There's a lot of, uh, it's kind of the stem cell therapy of yesterday, lots of trials of hyperbaric for neurologic damage, for kids with cerebral palsy. Almost all have been scams, but people have paid a lot of money for that in order to see if they, by giving their kids' brains better oxygen, would they get improvement in their cognitive abilities. None of that has paid it out. Air travel, most of you air traveled to get here. Your PO2 decreases from greater than 95 to 53 to 75 at a cabin altitude of 8,000 feet in a normal person. If your PO2 is less than 95 at sea level, let's say you're hypoxic to start with, the decrease in your PO2 8,000 feet is on the steeper part of the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve, and therefore you will have a far greater fall. So if your PO2 at sea level is 70, you go to 8,000 feet, it goes to 53 with a SAT of 84. Therefore, people with underlying lung disease should be screened prior to flight. These are the British thoracic guidelines. You know, we have guidelines for everything. Pulse oximetry. If your resting SAT on room air is greater than 95%, you don't need anything. If it's nine, less than 92%, they have to have oxygen in flight. We'll talk about that in a minute. 
Resting air, 92 to 95, you need to assess for risk factors for in-flight hypoxemia and consider for further testing. And if they're already on oxygen, because all my kids go on wishes, all my event kids seem to go on wishes, you know where they go, Disney World, right? And so you may need increased flow for the flight. So what do you need to do to send a patient on an airplane on oxygen? Well, you have to fill out a ton of paperwork, right? If your patient has a concentrator and it is an FDA approved concentrator, has to be portable, has to fit under the seat in front of them, then they can use their own concentrator and you have to write that they can use their own concentrator and you have to write what you want the leader flow to be. If they do not have a concentrator, they can rent one from their DME people. They will have to pay for it. Our lovely third party payers will not. And sometimes the airline itself will provide oxygen, but you have to be very careful with that because remember they're only going to provide it while you are on the plane. So that if your patient needs oxygen any other time, you have to get a concentrator that is FAA approved to go on the plane. And again, they can't be in the bulkhead seat because it has to go under the seat in front of them. So those are kind of the chronic things you need to know. So let's talk about pulmonary edema when you go too high. Let's say we go out to, uh, I don't even know what's high around here. Wayne may have to help me. Santa Fe is considered high. Okay, so let's say you go to one of those mountains. Uh huh. Okay, there you go. We'll go to Flagstaff. So let's say we're in Flagstaff and you get high altitude pulmonary edema. What is your best therapy? Diuretics, steroids, rapid descent, or oxygen? Okay, so let's talk about why this is the right answer. So yes, diuretics can be helpful, but if you have bad edema, you get off the mountain is the bottom line. You can give oxygen, but you really just need to get off the mountain. It's very interesting if you go to some of the very high altitude places. I gave a talk in um, Colorado, in um, Breckenridge. They sold oxygen in cans in the gift shop, and if you went to the spa, they'd check your saturation for you. And they'd give you an oxygen treatment if you needed one. So getting off the mountain is the most important thing. Diuretic can help mitigate some of the side effects, and steroids given in advance can help with the CNS effects, but they don't help with the lung effects. So what happens with high altitude pulmonary edema? You develop non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. You get pulmonary vasoconstriction, you get pulmonary hypertension, you get short of breath, you get chest pain, you get diaphoretic. You'll be weak, have decreased exercise tolerance, which is really hard when you're skiing. Cough, dyspnea at rest, and your chest will get tight and you'll be congested. You'll be maybe wheezing, you may turn blue, you'll be tachycardic, and tachypneic. There's something called the Lake Louise consensus definition where you need two symptoms and two signs to say you have pulmonary edema and high altitude pulmonary edema. And it's actually very easy to, to get and there is a very interesting phenomena of high altitude pulmonary edema. You can be to the same mountain 20 times and the 21st time you'll get high altitude pulmonary edema. It's not something that always happens to you. And remember that the people who live up there become somewhat accommodated to it, but even going down a thousand feet can be helpful in how you will feel. Therapy, high altitude pulmonary edema, early recognition of the signs and symptoms, rapid descent to a lower altitude, supplemental oxygen to keep your SATs greater than 90%, cautious use of diuretics, and bed rest. And so you can, high altitude cerebral edema is treated with acetazolamide and dexamethasone, and that's where the steroids come in. Is it really for more for CNS than lung issues? I know it's hard for a group of pulmonologists and I to believe that steroids could be useful for something other than the lung, but they can be.
So here's a nice ICU question for you. You are asked to consult on a six-month-old infant with complex congenital heart disease who's intubated in the PICU for bronchiolitis. He has atelectasis of the entire left lung. Which of the following airway clearance maneuvers is most likely to resolve the atelectasis? Increasing the PEEP, using a cough assist device, adding hypertonic saline, or flexible bronchoscopy with lavage? Interesting. So, increasing the PEEP on a lung that is totally collapsed may not help you because it may not see the effects of that PEEP. I mean, it is certainly something we would do in conjunction. Uh, cough assist isn't going to help you. The data on hypertonic saline is uh, not very uh, definitive in bronchiolitis. And so your pulmonologist, we love to what? We love to bronch, right? There's a person in Indianapolis called Don who sells guns. And his statement is, I don't want to make money, I just want to sell guns. So Michelle Hounstein, who was a fellow with me, and I have always said, we don't want to make money, we just love to bronc. Now that's what you do, we love to bronc, right? And so that's really the right answer to this. Now let's talk about airway clearance. This is a big thing today in the ICU and out of the ICU. Um, what's effective, what isn't. It's very respiratory therapist expensive. And in these days where we are being asked to cut back, cut back, cut back our cost, even if I wanted to use airway clearance, we are continually short of respiratory therapists in our institution. So what do we do for airway clearance? Let's start with what makes your airway clearance bad. If you have ineffective mucociliary clearance, such as uh, dysmodal cilia, if you have too many secretions, CP, pneumonia, et cetera, if you have thick, nasty secretions, CF. If you have a poor cough, neuromuscular disease, cerebral palsy. If you have restrictive lung disease, some of the uh, scoliosis patients, some of the rheumatologic patients. If you're immobile or you get inadequate exercise. If you have dysphagia, aspiration, or reflux. All of those are things that impede your ability to clear your airway. What happens? You get airway obstruction, mucus plugging, atelectasis. You get impaired gas exchange, infection, inflammation. Those of you who take care of patients with cystic fibrosis, this is your life, right? So when you look at the data on airway clearance, it's very interesting in that we really don't have very good data, even in the classic airway clearance disease of cystic fibrosis, that is effective. There was a study published in 1970-ish that looked at the use of percussion and postural drainage versus nothing in seven, seven, count them seven, number needed to treat, no, CF patients. And in that study, they did show that airway clearance improved FEV1. Since that study, every CF airway clearance study has compared the gold standard of percussional and postural drainage to another airway clearance technique. Now, we like to think, and I still do believe, airway clearance and CF makes a difference. This is moderate disease. And so, what do we want to do with it? So what diseases do we see that have bad airway clearance? CF, primary ciliary dyskinesia, neuromuscular diseases, and severe neurologic insult. There is no data for proven benefit for using airway clearance in pneumonia, asthma, not complicated by atelectasis or bronchiolitis. Yet many places, this is still routine when I trained. Everybody had asthma, everybody had pneumonia, everybody had bronchiolitis, had Q4 treatments, PMPD, whether they need it or not. Not really necessary and may actually make things worse. So here is the lovely mucus plug. You can see I do love to bronch. 
although actually John Stevens did this one. So what happens when you're doing airway clearance on a child with a mucus plug like that? Where can it go? It can go into the main stem bronchus. It can go into the subglottis. It might come out, but there are challenges to that. And then does airway clearance help this patient? Have you ever noticed that your CF patients, when they get certain airway clearance, will actually desaturate because you're moving secretions around and cause challenges? Now, I still firmly believe, before I get kicked out of the pulmonary group, that airway clearance is appropriate in CF. <laughs> the rest of places, I'd still debate to me, but I really do believe it helps us go from that moderate, keep going from moderate disease to end stage. What about pneumonia like this? absolutely no data that having influenza and pneumonia will benefit from physical airway clearance. Now there is some data to suggest that use of hypertonic agents may help thin these secretions enough that they can be coughed up. And we use a lot of hypertonic saline in the ICU in intubated patients because we've taken away their cough. And so if this patient were intubated, that might be helpful. The most effective airway clearance we have is what? Natural cough is getting those things up and out. Uh, sometimes, no matter what you have, you're going to need help with it, and that's going to be bronchoscopy. This is a tracheal cast in an endotracheal tube. And so if you have something like that occluding the airway or occluding the tube, this child coughed this tracheal cast up into this tube and then couldn't ventilate because it covers almost everything but the little Murphy port, which is a side port in an ET tube, so if you plug the end, you can still get a little bit of air through. So, in babies, there is no definitive data to support use in asymptomatic CF infants. This is the most likely age group to have adverse effects, especially reflux and aspiration. How many of you still use airway clearance in your CF infants? So a good number. I retired from CF two years ago, so I don't have any infants anymore, and the guidelines say you don't start it until they're symptomatic. Um, you have to modify your postural drainage to minimize side effects, and the biggest thing here for me, so my political statement, which I'm allowed to have because I'm old, older, almost as old as Wayne, so I can still pick on it, uh, is that it's a huge time commitment for families, and it's not just a time commitment, it's the guilt. The family comes in, they miss last night's chest physiotherapy session, and they feel bad. And the kid gets RSV, and that's why they got RSV. That's not why they got RSV. They got RSV because they were exposed to it, not because they missed a chest physiotherapy session. There are some other interesting devices you can use. Most of these are used in cystic fibrosis and dysmodal cilia. One is the PEP valve. This stands for positive expiratory pressure. It splints your airways open during exhalation. You can use it with aerosolized meds. It's technique dependent, which means you have to be committed and older. It's portable and it requires about 10 to 15 minutes. You can use the flutter, which loosens mucus through expiratory oscillation. Positive pressure splints the airways. You use it independently. It is technique dependent. If you do not hold it at a precise angle, you're not gonna get good oscillation. It's portable, doesn't work well at low airflow, so if you have end-stage CF, the flutter is not going to be helpful. Again, about a 10 to 15 time commitment. Acapello is a combined agent of the PEP valve and the uh, flutter. So what you do is it has a valve, magnet device in the center, interrupts extratory flow, therefore you can use it at any angle, whether you're laying down, sitting up, on your side, watching TV, similar time commitment. What are the contraindications for these types of valves? Pneumothorax, perforated eardrum, homoptysis, any postoperative lung surgery because you can break down the anastomosis site, bad heart disease, bad varices. So remember, a proportion of your CF patients have esophageal varices. And then pulmonary emboli. And then there's the vest. We all love the vest, right? We use this on the CF patients. We use it on the CP patients. We use it on the developmental delay neurologic patients. We use it on the neuromuscular patients, right? And I'm sure all of you do too. 
So what does the vest do? This is a high frequency chest oscillating device, uses pulses of air pressure applied to the chest wall to produce shearing at the air mucus interface. And then compression causes small little peak expiratory flows, expels mucus like a cough. So the chest wall, this is an important question part, chest wall is compressed, the air oscillates, okay? So you have no oscillation of the chest wall, it only compresses, and then the air only oscillates, and that helps you move secretions up the tracheobronchial tree. Initiation of vest therapy, well, the first thing is the smallest vest they make is 22 inches, so you have to have a chest conference of at least 22 inches. The third-party payers will not pay for a vest in our area of the country until you are 24 months old. Um, and again, if you're a small 24-month-old, you may not even be able to use it. Vest sizes range from small to extra large. It can accommodate a chest circumference up to 67 inches. It's a pretty big chest, men, if you think about the size of jackets that you wear. And insurance approval is tedious and varies dramatically from state to state. Contraindications, head and neck injury that's not been stabilized, active pulmonary hemorrhage, or hemodynamic instability, because you can get some alterations on venous return to the heart from the compression. Then there's the cough assist, one of my favorite things, actually. Creates a mechanical cough through the use of high flows at positive and negative pressures. You can use positive and negative pressures up to 60. And you set this minus 10 plus 10, minus 20 plus 20. You can use it independently if you are physically able or with caregiver assistance. Technique independent, portable, primarily used in muscular weakness diseases. And then there's Easy Pap. How many of you use Easy Pap in your hospital? Okay, so Easy Pap came into our hospital. No pulmonary doctor, no ICU doctor was consulted. It just appeared one day. Does that surprise any of you? And it is very similar to what the old IPPB did. Its indications, according to the FDA website, are prevention and treatment of atelectasis and lung expansion therapy. There is zero, I repeat, zero peer-reviewed data available about it doing anything other than costing money. I have responded to several rapid responses where the respiratory therapist was using EasyPAP and made the baby apneic. So you really do have to think about these things as you utilize them. But in some patients, it can be helpful. So what do the guidelines say about these types of airway clearance? The, this was done in, by the American College of Chest Physicians, or CHEST, in 2006. They reviewed Bedline for a long time. Most studies were done in CF patients, and most had serious method restraints. And they concluded that although some non-pharmacologic therapies are effective in increasing sputum production, long-term efficacy and improving outcomes, with unassisted cough is unknown, and that included in the CF population, and I will just step back there. The last time I gave this talk, I uh, had a lot of criticism. Of course it works, but th there really isn't good data to support it yet. Adverse effects, you can desat, you can reflux, you can aspirate, hyper hyperventilate, hypoventilate, you can obstruct. If that mucus plug goes up into your larynx, you may not be able to breathe can cause barotrauma with an overly aggressive therapist. It can hurt. And again, there's the guilt from non-adherence. Now, one of the things that we do think works reasonably well is incentive spirometry, which pediatric people don't use nearly as much as we could. Indications, atelectasis, post-op surgery, restrictive lung disease, bad diaphragm function, or acute chest syndrome in sickle cell. Risk, you can hyperventilate, you can get barotrauma, hypoxia, or bronchospasm. And what we use in small children who cannot use the incentive spirometer is we use bubbles and have them blow bubbles in order to try to get that expiratory flow. If I have an adolescent patient that has bad lung function going in for scoliosis repair, we actually teach them incentive spirometry before they go to the operating room so that they know the technique so that when they still have some anesthesia on board, they are able to participate. Other things you can use as part of your airway clearance, 
antibiotics. We have borrowed from the CF uh, population and give a lot of nebulized antibiotics now to non-CF patients. Bronchodilators may or may not improve airway clearance. Anti-inflammatory drugs, mucolytics, and then of course nutrition. Very important that you're not gonna have a strong cough if you are malnourished. So let's talk a little bit about aerosol drug delivery if you're going to use those. Aerosol is a suspension of a solid or liquid in a gas. Deposition of aerosols in the respiratory tract is very important. Remember, only a small amount of what you give actually gets to the lung. It's related to the physical properties of the aerosol. It's related to how it, it is deposited. It's related to how you breathe in, how you exhale. It's related to anatomic considerations and the actual disease process itself. So let's talk about particle distribution. You have multiple ways that a particle can be laid down. The first is called inertial impaction. And that means that the larger the mass of the particle, the greater the momentum. And that works primarily in your large airways. Sedimentation results from the effects of gravity. That makes sense that it falls out to the bottom. So the major process for this is in the distal airways because that's the bottom of the tracheobronchial tree. Diffusion are less than one microns. They're displaced by Brownian motion throughout the airway. Interception is the particle is similar in size to that of the airway. So it goes to one of the branching points and it sticks there because it fits. And then electrostatic charge has a minimal role in the therapeutic aerosols that we use. I knew this was the last uh, question before lunch, so I put it after the data slide so that you could feel knowledgeable going out to lunch. So the major mechanism of aerosol particle deposition in the distal airways is impaction, sedimentation, diffusion, or electrostatic charge. Okay, and, see, I, and I even told you in the slide before that it's sedimentation. I figure we all can use a break once in a while. So particle size does matter. This is a place where size clearly matters. Particle size is described by the MMAD, which is the mass median aerodynamic diameter. Yes, they expect you to know that. Distribution of particle size as an aerosol is the geometric standard deviation. So big particles, greater than six microns, stay in the upper airway and you'll get local and systemic side effects. So we really don't want anything too big. If they're less than five to six microns, they reach the lower airways in the alveoli, which is where we want them. And if they're too small, you just exhale them back out. They go in, they go out. So your ideal particle size for an aerosolized medication is somewhere between two to six microns. What patient variables affect aerosol delivery? Their flow rate, their age, breathing pattern, whether they breathe through their nose or their mouth, disease severity, if they have abnormal upper airway anatomy. You can think of somebody who has severe laryngeal malaysia and you're giving them an aerosol. A large part of that aerosol may end up on the supraglottis instead of down the airway, if they have physical or cognitive problems, and just the fact that they don't do what they're supposed to. I am sure all of your patients, however, do everything you tell them. Medication delivery systems, jet nebulizers were once the mainstay of our therapy. Uh, they do not reproduce particle size well. Even if you're using the same batch of meds, they were all designed on Bernoulli principle and a baffle. Dead space volume is a mill. The viscosity of the liquid influences the rate of medication, and the output decreases over time due to the evaporation and temperature change. So we really don't use those nearly as often as we used to. Uh, air entrapment affects dose. Largest dose per kilo is actually in the young child due to a tight-fitting mask. And paradoxical bronchoconstriction can be caused by preservatives, non-osmolar and acidic solutions. So before we ended up with uh, 
TOB for the CF population. We used nebulized tobramycin, which is made for IV injection, and there was some bronchospasm from that. Ultrasonic nebulizers, which is primarily what we use today, are quiet. They have a high output. The fluid is aerosolized by energy supplied by a, a piezoelectronic crystal that vibrates when a current goes through it. You cannot use it with a suspension like a steroid. Inclusive fluid temperature can denature protein. And particle size, again, varied among devices of the same design. Meter dose inhalers, you know, are medication suspended in propellants, HFA. Surfactant reduces particles from clotting together. You have to shake it before you use it as the particles in the propellant separate. How many of your patients actually shake their inhaler before they use it in a crisis? Not as many as you wish. And there's no evidence to support slow versus rapid inhalation, although rapid gives you more central disposition. But remember that the receptors for your bronchodilator are present in the upper parts of the airway also. Problems with meter dose inhaler, 40 to 50 percent of adults cannot use a meter dose inhaler correctly. Limited range, propellants can cause problems, and handling. It gets thrown in the glove compartment. What temperature do you think an MDI in a glove compartment here in Arizona at a temperature of 103 today will get? Pretty high. If we go back to Indiana, so when it's minus 10, what temperature do you think that inhaler gets to? It's not minus 10 right now, fortunately. It's actually about as hot as it is here. And so all of those things can impact. How many of you have had patients take an empty container for a long time? Lots of you, right? No dose counter. They don't know it's gone. They just keep taking it. Now, if you use volume holding chambers, that will allow deceleration and some shrinkage of the particles. Remember, that's a one-way valve, contains aerosol in the chamber until you open it by inspiratory effort. Both reduce oral pharyngeal deposition, so you have less risk of candida, more likelihood to get in the lung, and you don't have to be coordinated. So for many people, a volume uh, chamber is helpful, but again, it's one more piece of equipment for a child to take with them. And although you may give out a spacer device in your clinic, don't guarantee yourself that they're being used. So things that you want to take home today before lunch, pulse oximetry principle is the Beer-Lambert law. Venturi principle is Bernoulli's law. Airway clearance devices can cause a multitude of adverse reactions, including barotrauma, airway obstruction, aspiration, and reflux, and I think we still need more data to truly prove if they are effective or not. And again, you want to know where your particle sizes of an aerosol distribute. Greater than six microns in the upper airway, less than five microns down to two, lower airway and alveoli, less than one micron, they are exhaled in a healthy individual, in a sick individual, they may actually stay in the lung. Thank you very much, and uh, good luck. <laughs>